Well, first of all, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this panel where we're going to talk a, a bit about Anchor. Uh, and Anchor is sort of, you know, something that is a really novel approach to building staking derivatives with um, dollar liquidity. Um, but, you know, I think one more interesting thing about it is it's a kind of bridges the gap between proof of stake and DeFi and it provides a lot of benefits to many different chains and many different protocols. Um, so we have a bunch of great panelists today. Uh, we have Zaki uh, from Cosmos slash Occlusion. We have Jack from Polkadot. And we have Nick from Terra. And uh, I figure let's start with just maybe a, a brief intro from each of you and maybe a one liner of like what brought you into being interested in Anchor. Um, sure, I can go first. Um, on my screen, I'm in the upper right. Um, the, uh, so Zaki, um, Cosmos, um, I gave a talk on staking derivative um, at your chain conversation. I'm getting some feedback on someone's computer. Do they mind? Cool. Let uh, me mute myself just to be sure. Sorry. Okay. Um, cool. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I, or you might edit this. I don't know. Um, Zaki from Occlusion and Cosmos. Um, been working on the Cosmos project for a while. Been working on proof of stake for a while. Been working on validators for a while. Uh, Occlusion, we run validators on the Cosmos Hub and Terra. Uh, selective. We also run a, um, a data availability node for uh, Diversify and the Stark, Stark Dex. Um, we're slowly expanding the surface area of infrastructure that we run. Uh, but, uh, so, you know, have been experiencing the business validators um, for a long time, have been figuring out like how to deploy proof of stake networks. Um, back in the summer of 20, uh, 2019, I really started to see the uh, connections between DeFi and staking and sort of the inevitability of sort of financialization of some of these risks. Um, and right now I'm working on Stargate upgrade to Cosmos, which will bring uh, sort of interchain blockchain, uh, inter-blockchain communication um, and sort of an economy on top of Cosmos to life. Uh, and so a lot of times people ask like, where is Stargate going? Like what is Stargate to? And I think in many ways it's, uh, uh, a Stargate is to like an economy and a fi financial primitives on top of Cosmos. So I'm uh, excited to be part of Anchor. Hey, uh, I'm Jack. I can go next. Um, I work at uh, Web3 Foundation and, and launching a fund uh, focused on kind of the Polkadot ecosystem called Hypersphere. And um, yeah, I've been working on Polkadot stuff for a couple of years. We just recently launched Polkadot um, last month. And the next steps for us are to, to launch kind of the, the sharded architecture so that blockchains can hook up to Polkadot for shared security. And what brings me here today is kind of interest in um, some of the blockchains that can do that. Um, uh, Terra is, is kind of going cross blockchain and uh, built with the Cosmos SDK, but would eventually kind of be bridged to, to Polkadot using um, a bridge course one is putting together. And and then there, we have a couple kind of native shards, uh, one called Akala that is super interesting that also has kind of a staking derivative architecture where you can stake your derivative, stake your dots through kind of this, this specific shard, or this specific pair chain, and then you receive the L dot token. So uh, we're happy to see an additional, uh, what in this version is called B assets, which I'm sure we're gonna go into. Um, additional versions of these staking derivatives come come to life. Uh, uh, cool, yeah, and uh, I'm Nick. Um, I've been leading research uh, at Terra for the past uh, two and a half years. Uh, and a bit of a background about <clears throat> what uh, we've been up to and uh, why we're investing in Anchor and uh, the interchain um, Asset Association. So for the first uh, year or so at Terra, our focus was uh, very much on medium of exchange. So 
um, we built the chain on uh, Tendermint using the Cosmos SDK, and we've um, Terra has been used for e-commerce payments uh, in Korea across um, dozens of merchants, and we currently have uh, about a million and a half users. So we've sort of proven the use case to adoption via payments, um, and recently we've become quite interested in in DeFi and in particular how to make Terra a uh, holding worthy currency. So something that can give you um, uh, interest and, and make it sort of more more interoperable with uh, the rest of DeFi. And that's where the motivation of, of for Anchor comes from. Um, now, you know, pairing this with uh, staking derivatives, the idea has been that uh, basically the ability to leverage block rewards from a variety of different blockchains creates an interesting uh, primitive that um, could uh, basically subsidize interest uh, for a stable coin as opposed to purely relying on a um, market and um, uh, money market as, as for example what you see in compound and so very excited to uh, be here with you guys and discuss how we can create interoperable uh, DeFi and you know eventually make anchor successful not just on the Terra blockchain but on, on multiple chains like Polkadot, Cosmos and so on. Great. Um, and yeah, I guess, uh, you know, I, I think all three of you kind of hinted a little bit at, at what Anchor does, um, but I just wanted to give a kind of maybe more direct description. So, so Anchor is a, a staking derivative that allows users to borrow Terra USD, which is a stable coin. It's an algorithmic stable coin um, that uh, uses sort of a combination of a signage like model and a, a debt instrument like model where the debt instrument is a staking currency. Um, and the staking derivative allows you to borrow against your future expected cash flows, um, which are your block rewards from a variety of proof of stake currencies. And it's, you know, it's really meant to be like a money market akin to um, sort of compound, except instead of borrowing against assets you have right now at a over collateralized rate, you're borrowing against assets you're going to earn in the future. So it's a lot more similar to what, what exists in trade finance. Um, and so, you know, in that vein, you know, I, all of you have spent a bunch of time for coming at this from different angles. Uh, in Zaki's case, running a validator. Um, in Nick's case, I mean, building a stable coin. So there's a natural reason for a money market. Um, and in Jack's case, you know, working through an ecosystem that has many different types of staking derivatives and, and flavors. So uh, could each of you, in your own words, explain why Anchor excites you? And I know, Nick, you kind of did say this a little bit already, but hopefully you can find some something you missed. Uh, and how it impacts the projects you're working on and sort of what, what where it fits in in the grand scheme of, of what you guys are working on. You want to take a stab at this, Jack, or I can? Yeah, absolutely. So from where uh, where I kind of spend the most time is is in the Polkadot ecosystem. So I can I can kind of talk about that a little bit more. Um, in Polkadot, it's a proof of stake system and, and you stake dots. Uh, and uh, we have kind of a more aggressive approach to staking. We use kind of this, uh, this algorithm called nominated proof of stake. And in that, the unbonding period to get your dots back after you stake them is 28 days. So you, you go, okay, right, I want to stake 10, 10 dots. And, um, and then, you know, three weeks later, you decide that you need those dots for whatever reason. It will take you upon deciding that you need those dots for whatever reason, you kind of click the unbond button and then a 28 day roughly um, clock starts. So that's not exactly great UX if you quickly want to get liquidity for you know whatever reason that you might need um, the funds for. So uh, what really excites me about the, the potential for additional staking derivatives are um, to be able to get that liquidity more quickly. Um, and, and maybe you also want to keep your tokens staked the whole time. Um, and staking derivatives kind of allow you still to have um, that liquidity to, to do whatever you want, whether it's taking advantage of other like opportunities that you have or, or whatnot. But it's really important that um, if there are multiple staking derivatives, that the, the, at least the ones that are used have liquidity um, and that you can actually, like, people actually accept them. Is one thing just to get this receipt or this IOU for these block, or, you know, these future cash flows, but it, people actually have to 
to recognize that they uh, are useful. And, um, and I think that's, you know, Anchor seems to, seems to be taking a right approach here um, in that they're, they're doing it across multiple blockchains, hopefully getting network effects from doing that, um, and then tapping into kind of non-blockchain users. So it seems like Terra is focused on um, individuals that maybe just have a smartphone um, or individuals who maybe are just more used to like a regular savings rate that's maybe, I don't know, 50 basis points or 1% 1, 1 and you just keep your money in a bank account and you're used to having like a steady rate of return for a year or two years or five years or whatever, uh, which you current really, really can't get with many other staking derivatives as far as, as, far as I know. Um, so that's one of the reasons hopefully it attracts more kind of mainstream adoption for that reason, which brings more people into crypto, expands the pie, which is good for, I think, everybody, everybody here. So one of the things that I think is, is probably one of the most sort of on drew my attention to staking derivatives almost up. And I think is the, um, is it a to me that staking derivatives are, are a center in these networks? Um, and the, the reason why that is the case is because, um, you know, atoms are sort of widely available on many ex and many of those uh, exchanges will allow you to um, earn staking rewards just from holding atoms on those exchanges for the period that you hold them until you trade them. Um, and this basically has turned like a big chunk of the liquid atoms that are out there um, on exchanges into essentially derivatives. Um, and if you want to have um, a parity between like centralized validator ecosystem um, you know, a validator business like occlusion um, and the um, and the the sort of user experience and um, sort of financial model that is is available um, to uh, people who are staking on centralized exchanges. We need to establish some mechanism for um, for sort of uh, centralized staking derivatives um, uh, to exist. Otherwise, you know, uh, the inevitable sort of financial gravity uh, towards like you know, every proof of stake network being run by five exchanges uh, uh, is, you know, uh, is that much more powerful. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think is, is perhaps most exciting to me about all of the work that we're doing on, on staking derivatives and sort of doing this at, you know, the scale that Terra is able to bring um, um, and with the sort of uh, asset that is Terra USD. Uh, is, is, is it makes uh, sort of helps actually sort of solve a bit of the challenges that we've always faced in designing these things, which it's actually quite hard to design because of that uh, uh, need for the asset to be widely recognized to, 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 to get something um, as uh, robust at, as, as that's like competitive um, with the way, um, you know, uh, a Binance atom is branded as an atom. Um, Nick, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think both Jack and, and Zach did an excellent job at, uh, at pitching both, you know, why sticking derivatives are interesting and, and Anchor in particular. So there isn't that much uh, for me to add. Uh, I'll say a couple of things. So one is adding a bit to what Jack said. Our focus very much is <clears throat> on uh, making Anchor a very intuitive uh, and predictable product for um, retail investors who potentially have very little, if, if not any, um, experience and understanding with, uh, and so that's why uh, a lot of the focus is on delivering a stable interest rate. And as uh, Jack hinted, uh, one of the concerns that we've uh, had with protocols like Compound is that um, they've established very powerful primitives. But if you look at the rate that someone gets, say, on um, Circle or on Dai and so on, it tends to be quite cyclical uh, because it leverages demand. And so in, in bull markets, you have interest rates that are increasing and, and vice versa for bear markets. And so, you know, for a retail investor who's used to, say, a savings account, that's not a, a very intuitive. And so the idea is to basically have a buffer of, um, block rewards, which you can use to subsidize that rate that um, depositors can expect. And so even if the 
rate that, le that lenders are, or sorry, the, the rate that borrowers are paying uh, might move with uh, leverage. Um, those book rewards help you stabilize that rate, and I think that makes it a much more intuitive product. Um, a, a separate thought, uh, adding to what Zaki said, is uh, I, I and the, the Terra team definitely share uh, his concerns around um, basically most uh, or a, a large fraction of uh, liquidity of POS assets and Bitcoin, uh, in fact, being concentrated on a small number of exchanges. And I think one particular risk which has uh, recently started being discussed and um, I think as a community we need to uh, think deeply about and address is the fact that um, as a tiny number of exchanges concentrate liquidity, uh, something that may happen as a sort of unintended consequence of this is having a, a form of hidden inflation rate. We're taking Bitcoin as a simplest example. If uh, exchanges allow the trading or withdrawals of more Bitcoin than has been deposited, it's possible that no one will notice. And it's possible that actually, um, you know, in, in most cases, they're not going to have um, a bank run. Uh, but this, you know, defeats the the very principles on which those currencies are built and you know it can it can break fundamental assumptions and so i think for bitcoin as for um proof of and therefore to zaki's point making this a more decentralized process where on chain you can guarantee that for every b luna or every b atom there is a um commensurate amount of the underlying token that's locked up i think that gives confidence to um ecosystem participants and fundamentally it guards the uh, the principles which I think uh, could be in a sort of hidden way uh, broken uh, when focusing on centralized exchanges. Yeah, for sure. Uh, when you were saying that, I was just thinking about how much people trust the funding rate calculations that they're liquidated on on derivatives exchanges. Do, if you can't really audit them, to be honest. And uh, I'd say 50% of it lawsuits against exchanges tend to be on things related to what you're talking about. So I think it's, it might already be here uh, to some extent where, where people only know this when it's too late. Um, so, you know, maybe taking a step back, uh, you know, Zaki, you run a validator, uh, Nick and Jack, you guys talk to presumably a bunch of validators. Uh, maybe at a high level, you know, we understand kind of the supply side of the market which is people who want savings accounts. So they have some funds, they want to earn some interest on it, and they want to do it in a predictable way. But what about the, the other side of the market, the, the demand side of the market, the, the validators who want liquidity? Uh, you know, I think it's kind of somewhat intuitive to say like, okay, from, from Jack's perspective, 28 days, you know, you're a business, you have to pay Google Cloud or AWS and stuff like that, so you need cash. But uh, you know, because you, you've spoken with a lot of validators, um, could you like share some details about like what are some of the challenges, liquidity challenges you've seen and heard of directly and sort of what, what, at what times do they find themselves really needing USD liquidity? And, and, and the real reason for asking this is, you know, this market needs both sides to function for, for it to be super successful. Um, and, I, you know, I think a lot of people kind of understand the supply side more or less, like everyone wants to earn yield uh, risklessly with quotation marks. But the demand side is actually, it's not as obvious unless you are a validator. So maybe if you, you guys want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I can talk a little bit about how, how the economics of running a validator uh, appear to work at this stage of the game. Um, you know, right now, you know, mo like virtually every validator is cross chain to some extent. So they um, they they man they like sort of manage protocol risk to a certain extent by participating in multiple protocols and multiple uh, and and typically right now increasingly validators have multiple lines of business um, across multiple ecosystems. So you know um, uh, Jack was mentioning the Cosmos SDK to Substrate Bridge that Course One is running. They're also a validator. Uh, but they also are doing uh, this kind of, they do kind of engineering work. They have a great product for um, doing accounting of proof of stake returns called Anthem that uh, I would highly recommend. Um, it would not have been able to do 2019 taxes without Anthem or it would have re required writing a whole bunch of code. 
Um, so you have these validators, we have these diverse, validators become these like diversified businesses. Um, but I think one of the other things that like validators are doing is they are, are validator you are, are fundamental along um, the, the, the protocols and the assets that you validate on. Um, and what um, a validator has to do most of the year just to, you know, make payroll uh, is constantly manage that long exposure. Uh, and right now, our only tool really for long exposure is selling our staking rewards uh, periodically. And so there's like quite a bit of work that goes in, you know, planning when those sales will be, managing a cash. And, uh, our, these assets are very volatile, um, just understanding um, what to do that. And um, you, you sort of see the impacts of that sort of across the economics of a protocol. And I do think that like sort of adding new tools um, for, for validators to sort of manage that long exposure um, is probably healthy um, and doesn't necessarily result in like sort of a pathological collapse in security. Yeah, I think one of the things you mentioned there is really interesting is like planning when to sell the assets, right? Like just because you're, you know, I, I, I don't know how much the, like the Venn diagram overlap is between um, people who are really good at understanding when to sell and people who are really good at running validators is. It's probably not um, that high, especially right now. In, in the game, I'd say, like if you're validating on all these networks and you're just getting all these tokens, it's like a lot of risk, like, and you have to be a risk manager and understand kind of, I mean, you have to be a trader, essentially, you have to be trading these assets. Um, and I don't think many of the validator businesses today are doing that. Um, with the advent of staking derivatives, like like the one I mentioned, LDOT, um, Akala's staking derivative or, or Anchor, um, uh, I think that's going to accelerate probably the move to um, more finance focused validator groups. Um, but um, we're starting to see like many groups came, uh, to Zaki's point, many groups came and said, hey, we're going to be a validator. Like this is our business. This is how we add value to the ecosystem. But you're already seeing them having to tangentially go into different other businesses like Cryptium, um, Course One you mentioned. Um, I think it's going to continue to be the case where um, they're either going to be more dev focused because they got, I think most of the validators today have gotten from like a dev angle or they're going to be more like trader focused and uh, because that like that's how you're going to be able to make a risk adjusted returns on a on a um, ongoing basis if you know how to manage that portfolio of, of assets that you're getting every day. Um, so it's it's really interesting to see like that happen, especially whenever I feel like the validator, at least the, the service is kind of almost a race to the bottom in many respects, that they have to make money somewhere else. Think about the last few. Uh, yeah, not much to, to add on my end. I think uh, uh, it's, if you compare, the one thought here is if you compare uh, proof stake to proof of work, uh, I think one of the innate or inherent disadvantages of uh, proof of stake uh, uh, protocols on the validator side is, uh, as Jack mentioned, the fact that liquidity uh, from the protocol standpoint is uh, quite far out. And so if you compare the proof of work, you know, miners have continuous income stream in terms of uh, mining new coins. And so I think staking derivatives could be from a um, sort of ecosystem uh, standpoint a way to equate some of that difference and to help validators have more of that continuous um, income stream compared to say proof of work miners. Cool. And you know this this might be more of a quick question. Um, I, and and to to actually to Jack's point, I think I had been on this podcast with uh, with uh, a bunch of proof of stake people saying exactly the same thing, which is the first generation of validators are probably all going to die. And, uh, but the second generation is going to be a bunch of trading firms, kind of very similar to how electronic markets evolved in the late 90s, where like a bunch of the people who built exchanges died. But then a lot of HFT firms turned into exchanges, and that's being the primary example, um, and, and some of the Dutch Bourse now. But I, I, think, I think that's a very... Um, point and observation that's happened multiple times in history. 
and so it, it's kind of interesting to see that the analogy kind of come full, full form. Um, but maybe a, a, just a quick hitting question is, given the cross-chain nature and kind of the many liquidity pools that theoretically you can tap, how big do each of you think this pool could get in, in dollar terms? And do you think it's possible for Anchor to be a billion dollar money market? I have no idea, um, to be honest, uh, potentially. Um, I mean, that would, I think that would, that would be great into this, like, um, well, I, I think what we've seen with some of these, with, with some of these uh, money markets is the way they're governed, how they're, what they're backed by. I think the evolution of that's going to be really interesting if it's, um, you know, certain percent Terra, certain percent DOT, a certain percent Atom, um, and how that fluctuates based on the success of those networks and who's making those decisions is probably going to be pretty um, pretty interesting to see see happen, um, but uh, in crypto, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, it, it probably <laughs> is the answer. Um, I was trying to do a few sort of backup calculations as to um, kind of like the size of uh, sort of the atom winning market, right? Uh, my guess is the Adam money market like could probably be imputed to be $1 million dollars in size um, right now. Um, and so you might be able to hypothesize that. Uh, so the question is really, can we, can we 10 X that? Um, and uh, I guess the dynamics around this, I think are going to be relatively um, interesting to see. Um, I think that we're, you know, um, as we as we sort of enter the post Stargate IBC world, um, the like degrees of freedom by which delegators and validators um, are able to like construct and compose economics and uh, cash flow models. Um, like right now, you know, during the bootstrapping phase of Cosmos, um, the cash flows are all just um, speculation on future uh, value of atoms uh, and inflation of atoms uh, because really the network doesn't do very much uh, yet. We're still in the early days. Um, but post IBC, lots of new cash flow possibilities uh, take off um, and lots of opportunities for validators to sort of start differentiating themselves also take off uh, by what kind of services that they provide, uh, that, they, that their stake atoms run against and what sort of cash flows get delivered to their delegators. Um, so all in all, um, I would say, you know, is TechX plausible? I would like to think um, 10X is plausible. Um, I'm just sort of thinking about all of the sort of staked atoms on exchanges and um, sort of lending markets and derivatives markets that exist around atoms today. Um, and sort of just, it seems plausible that like, you know, 10X in that is possible. Yeah, so in my mind for Anchor to succeed and become a billion or multi-billion dollar money market, uh, obviously you need to look at both sides of the market, right? And I think uh, uh, so far we've been thinking a lot about the um, demand, well, depending on what you call demand or supply, demand side being uh, the demand for interest. Uh, and so basically attracting as much uh, retail interest as possible and bringing um, basically mainstream investors who have little or no or little or no familiarity with uh, cryptocurrency um, having them you know invest uh, of their uh, product like this I think uh, it is basically the path to a multi-billion dollar um, demand side and then of course on the, on the supply side uh, you know for the, for those two to be in balance I think the key is working um, with guys like Zaki, like uh, Jack, and other proof stake protocols, in order to be able to pool that cross chain liquidity and to make Anchor a compelling product for validators across chains to gain liquidity. And I think uh, it's the solution sort of lies in the intersection of those two in order to scale uh, to multi billion dollar. Cool. Uh, switching switching gears slightly. Um, so you know, Terra was one of the first launched um, algorithmic stablecoins that had more or less its own chain. 
Um, I mean, I guess there were some examples that didn't survive, but the, the first sort of surviving one. Uh, and, you know, congratulations, of course. But one, one question kind of related to this is, you know, you're building this staking money market around uh, an algorithmic stablecoin. And so what are the things that are uniquely enabled by having an algorithmic stablecoin as the base of your money market versus sort of a custodial circle style stablecoin? And, and there's a sort of a corollary question. Do you expect custodial stablecoins to somehow still be necessary? Kind of what, what's kind of their role in this, if any? Uh, maybe, maybe I can take a, a first stab here. So uh, it's definitely an interesting question. And I think um, perhaps starting with the second piece, uh, I think custodial stablecoins are obviously the uh, the sort of more intuitive and easiest way with which stablecoins came into existence. So, you know, with Tether, I think everyone has had concerns, but the fact that they've been able to establish this network effect, you know, they've been around for many years, um, they're available on every single exchange. I think it's this network effect which have, has given them power as opposed to necessarily the, the belief that um, their accounting practices are, are wise or even that the future of, uh, of the ecosystem should lie with um, uh, centralized stablecoins. So I think sort of it's, uh, the bets are off as to uh, the extent to which uh, they will keep dominating or we will be able to have uh, stablecoins like Terra have higher market share on the trading side. Uh, because, you know, for, for context, our focus has been entirely on, uh, for the time being, on means of payment uh, and scaling sort of adoption for, for payments. Uh, and so whether or not Terra or Sell or some other stablecoin is going to dominate or, or at least steal decent market share from centralized stablecoins uh, in the exchange and, and trading sphere, I think remains to be seen. And potentially a lot will come down to how we can uh, scale those stable coins uh, in, this, uh, in DeFi. Uh, so that's one side. Um, on, the, on the earlier question, I think um, it's, at least from my standpoint, it's less so necessarily about the algorithmic nature of Terra, which um, enables it to be um, a good fit for a, a money market. But I'd say uh, it's more so the question of, um, Liquidity, and what I mean by that is uh, more so uh, cross-chain liquidity. So, if you think about um, most most centralized stablecoins, most of those have most liquidity on Ethereum, right? And Ethereum has no native uh, proof-of-stake asset, and so in that sense, having an anchor-like money market on Ethereum is um, uh, would be quite challenging, right? Uh, and basically, you know, I think the advantage here is that if you look at the um, something like the Terra chain, the fact that you have a native POS at, asset as well as a stablecoin makes it uh, much more straightforward to basically bootstrap the system with Luna as the initial um, Luna and B Luna as the initial type of collateral uh, with this algorithm stablecoin, and then scaling it sort of further. Of course, the key to scaling this will be integrating Atom, integrating Polka dot and so on. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'd say that at the moment, if you look at most centralized um, stable coins being on Ethereum, there isn't this uh, sort of existing native POS assets to, to bootstrap the system. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say the, so the, the second question, true, and I'd actually be, I'd be curious what your take is on this. It sounds like you might, you might have something in mind, but um, I mean, for my part, as far as like, the network effects question uh, and what stable coins are used for. It's, it's, it, 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 there's a plethora of stable coins, obviously, uh, and they're all coming at it from different angles. Like um, Nick just mentioned kind of the payments angle and sell is kind of more open finance and there's DeFi like stable coins that I'd argue kind of like maker DAO might be or in our ecosystem like Akala. Um, and then you have kind of the, the more trader like stable coins like USDT I think is, is your, it's largely used for that. Um, but it comes down to trust and liquidity. And I think people still trust more like, hey, there's some amount of money in a bank account somewhere backing this, um, if it is one-to-one -one with, with the US dollar. Uh, and, and then the liquidity aspect, like how, like how reactive um, and how much does it incentivize liquidity provisioning? Uh, or how reactive is it to demand and, um, 
in the market. So with the biggest stable coin by like, I don't know, it's, I think I feel like it's an order of magnitude, but maybe maybe less USCT, it's, it's just liquidity. They just have tons of liquidity and you can get in and out of positions with no slippage and you more or less trust that some amount of money is in a bank account there um, in, in BPI or wherever else. So it, uh, it works. So I guess the way I think about this is, is so I think the overall dominant effects are like liquidity, number of venues that you have access to uh, for a stable client, all of these things. Um, but there, but I do think, um, you know, this, this question of uh, capital efficiency um, also represents like a pretty big and important um, piece in the, um, in the sort of stable coin market. Um, it does seem like if we can make a stable coin that is sort of backed by the robust future cash flows of, um, uh, of, of some, uh, some proof of stake asset um, that is running sort of as intended, um, it will be much more capital efficient than locking up like large amounts of capital um, in like just like a savings account um, that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, in in or like in a in a bank account the way USDC works um, and so uh, so there's that and I think I guess uh, what's sort of interesting and exciting about Terra to me is like they're one of the first projects to really uh, start experimenting with this architecture. Great. Uh, so we are, we're actually running pretty close to the end of our time. So I'm going to try to basically conclude with uh, one question, kind of an overall risk question, asking about the risks that users are taking, because obviously there's no free lunch um, in, 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 in these capital efficiency types of things. And I think the last thing is maybe talk, just maybe to say something about the Interchain Asset Association, which um, all three of you are, are a part of. So you know, I think I, I've spent a bunch of time personally thinking about this and writing kind of this paper with, with Alex Evans on, on how to try to quantify risk and try to measure whether things are capital efficient or whether there's inequality uh, in systems that have staking derivatives. Um, but, you know, when you're building these systems, you have to think about the users who maybe they're, let's pretend they're comfortable using Maker or Compound, which is not you know, even then that's a very select set of users who are, are comfortable understanding when they get liquidated, what condition, under what conditions kind of they need to move their assets or go top up their collateral. In the staking derivative world, it's even much more complicated. You have the intertwining of price action with future cash flow changes due to getting slashed, due to other conditions that uh, are related to, to partic correct participation in these networks. So how do you make the UX of risk palatable to the, to the end user? Because I think this is one of the reasons Compound has grown so much is that they have figured out a much simpler UX than Maker and other participants for sort of at least kind of managing your risk. So, uh, you know, how, how do you guys think about it, both from the validator and like the savings account holder perspective? So one of the things that I think is potentially good about all of this is um, in general, I think validators are like sort of under differentiated um, from the point of view of staking right now. Um, uh, you know, and some protocols are trying to optimize for like making validators sort of this nameless, brandless, undifferentiated like fun network functionality. Um, but that's never been really my vision. Um, for, for what, what validators should be. I feel like validators should be like a fairly distri uh, 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 So, you know, I do think that, you know, in the, I would like to see more differentiation and I would, you know, I think I would be generally likely like to see like sort of, um, you know, stuff like this make create like a rating agency for validators that um, I think actually would probably be a, uh, would be net healthy for the economy and also uh, potentially helpful um, in sort of allowing validators to more effectively compete against uh, the exchanges. Uh, so, so that's one aspect of it. Um, I think that, yes, I think your observation about, you know, does, you know, having um, good UX around risk being very important to, uh, 
to, to the success of any of these instruments is important. Um, and so there's like, in general, these like information resources that potentially need to happen. Uh, but also I think it will be, uh, um, it, it will help inform like as we, as we work with the Energy Analysis Association on, you know, the design of Anchor and the evolution of Anchor to like, to keep that in mind. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, and some of the things we talked about earlier, like liquidity is, is the UX thing, like how much slippage there is when you can get in and out um, of positions. But yeah, Compound's done a great job of that. And I think it's critical for like any, any system that's serious about staking derivatives to, um, to get that right, to make it easy, easy to create the, the B asset and, and, um, and kind of the, the, the anchor um, land, like uh, what, do you, what hoops do you have to go through to get that? And then exactly to ruin like what, what's the trust guarantees or or what's what what um, how how do the users feel about uh, the potential for loss under a slashing event or in a, a different circumstance like that? And uh, so yeah, really curious to see how that pans out. Yeah, I think this is a, an excellent question, and fully agree with uh, what Zaki and. And Jack just said, so um, I think on the one hand, when it comes to education and information, I think the Interchain Asset Association can serve a key role in making sure there is enough education, the risks are discussed, and sort of everyone understands that there is significant upside in this technology, but it is um, definitely very young. And so we're still figuring out exactly how it will become robust. Uh, the second is that I think until we get to a point where uh, both the systems have been proven to be quite robust, faith in, um, in their functionality, uh, developing is, is quite key and something that we've been thinking about in a few dimensions. Uh, so yeah, without getting into too much detail, I think insurance both uh, from a slashing standpoint as well as on the liquidation side um, is, uh, is quite key. And so there's always a trade-off, right, between um, risk and capital efficiency. And I think that uh, uh, potentially in the beginning, it makes sense to sacrifice some capital efficiency in order to have those systems well insured, and then over time sort of give up. Uh... Yeah, definitely. Um, cool. So, you know, all three of you have mentioned the Interchain Asset Association, and so I know we're out of time, but maybe could each of you maybe give a tweet, in a tweet, what you would say about your protocol's participation and sort of what what you're excited about with it. And uh, it's cool to see kind of different chains working together towards the same um, goal. Um, I would say that generally, um, I think like very much on the top of mind for, for, for Cosmos, for Atom holders, is really now that like, you know, we're on the verge of having an interchain um, like uh, uh, the, the interchain that we imagined when we started working on Cosmos um, and with things like Polkadot launching, um, starting to figure out what is the, what is the role of atoms in this ecosystem. Um, and so that's a big part of why uh, I have like sort of participating in the Interchain Assets Association is that to, you know, eventually find, uh, is to start working on this process of um, comparative advantage for the atom token and like what it does in a, in a world of many blockchains. Yeah, um, it, uh, agreed. Uh, I mean, Polkadot is it, uh, the basic thesis is is the world's going to have multiple chains. It's going to be a polychain future. There's going to be chains for different things, um, uh, from banking to music to to, to to finance to all these things. So um, we're excited to to work with with Terra. Uh, definitely excited to work with more with Cosmos uh, using the technology that some of the um, developer teams straddling different cross chain ecosystems are building like the bridges and so forth. And um, yeah, I'd say the, the, the major thing is, I, I don't think we've seen the power of cross chain because right, like Cosmos and Polkadot really haven't built it yet. Um, and as those ecosystems get built out, I think we're gonna see the power of cross chain stable coins that can leverage, right? The biggest capital base um, in the world for crypto, which is which is Bitcoin, having trustless bridges to Bitcoin, having trustless bridges to Ethereum um, in between these cross chain ecosystems. I think 
future looks much more like a web than these siloed um, individual kind of um, uh, centers. So um, I, I think uh, Tara seems to be on the, on the, on the cutting edge of, of these developments. And I think it's also a testament to people's change in mindset when they approach building software and crypto. It's less, much, it seems to be much less tribalistic um, than it was even six months, 12 months ago. It's just people making pragmatic decisions about the best, like, best software for their solutions. And I think this anchor is an example of that. So we're excited to be a part of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it concise. In my mind, I think it comes down to um, having well thought out research as well as governance around how all those new technologies uh, will evolve. Uh, and yeah, as uh, I think has been a trend in AI, uh, the question around what future do we want here and uh, how do we plan it in a way that doesn't surprise us with the merged properties we haven't thought about in advance, I think very much so uh, with um, DeFi and proof stake and stake derivatives, the motivation is, uh, is very similar. And so honored to work with guys like Psyche and Jack, and I think as we expand this association, um, our ability to think through the challenges as well as increase collaboration to make sure that the SICO system ends up where we want it to be as opposed to some, um, some version that uh, you know, has uh, much more risk than we wanted to. I think that's the key idea. Awesome. Um, well, thanks for, thanks everyone for, uh, for, for tuning in and hopefully you can ask, uh, any of these guys questions on Twitter, presumably, uh, so, or, you know, if you want to say how best to contact you. Uh, Twitter's great. great. Yeah. At Z Munion on Twitter. Works. Cool. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a Q and A after. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. Thanks. Um, Take care, guys. Have a good evening.